two decades of myocarditis, uh, I think we've, if I reflect over this period of time, we've become more comfortable managing the disease. Uh, I think we know how to do it, and the survival as a result has substantially improved, both in terms of the acute phase of the disease, but in terms of longer term survival if they needed uh, uh, bridging to transplantation. The etiology is still primarily a viral infection, although that, uh, there's ep epidemiologic change over time. First, uh, in the 70s and 80s, was pr principally the uh, enteroviruses, uh, Coxsackie in particular. In the 90s, the adenovirus started to become more uh, prevalent on biopsies. In the last uh, decade, parvovirus, the herpes viruses, influenza have all started to become uh, more commonly found on uh, biopsies. I'm not drawing any conclusions from that. The geographic and seasonal variations that we know are also unchanged, and there are a number of other uh, causes for uh, acute myocarditis. Once again, haven't changed over time. I think we'll see an increasing incidence of uh, patients with Lyme disease as that uh, tick-borne um, disease moves further north. The pathogenesis, I think we have some increasing understanding of this, um, and it's uh, the, the spectrum from acute fulminant myocarditis, acute myocarditis with direct myocyte injury from the virus through to a subacute phase and a chronic phase is really uh, mediated by um, immunological activation and um, autoimmune activation as well. We don't know what triggers this cascade in certain individuals and not in others or even how to mitigate it at this particular point in time. But I think we have a better understanding of the pathogenesis of the disease. Do we have a better understanding of the actual presentation and the phenotype? This study looked at a large administrative database from 42 hospitals in the US over a 10-year period. They found variable presentation of uh, acute myocarditis and couldn't identify a unique phenotype. Other than we do know that there is a sort of a, a, a variation in the age of presentation. You can see two main peaks, infancy, early childhood, those first uh, six to six months to perhaps 18 months, and then in later adolescence. Uh, we know that about 75% of these patients end up in critical care, about 40% get ventilated, and mechanical support occurs in about 20%. That gives us some idea as to the resources that are required to manage these patients and should, uh, in particular, inform the way in which we transfer patients between institutions. This is work that was um, led by Ben Sivaraj in a children's hospital at uh, Sick Kids. Um, hospital for Sick Children uh, last year and looked at 60 patients with uh, acute myocarditis. Uh, the point on this slide is that there is an early recovery phase over the first 12 months and there's um, particularly those first, uh, you know, that first month, I think the median time to start showing recovery was around 10 days, but you can see that there is a, uh, a recovery phase over the first 12 months and then a much longer tail where patients uh, may show some signs of ventricular recovery, uh, but not uh, normalize. Ben and his group also looked at what are some of the characteristics of these patients, and the AFM is the acute fulminant myocarditis, the second group are those with acute myocarditis, and you can see that there is some difference in age of presentation with acute fulminant myocarditis, they tend to be younger, more frequently have abnormal vital signs. The predominant complaints important Acute fulminant myocarditis, GI symptoms occurred in about 65%. So you can see that now it's pre presumably related to low output state. And that can be a frequently missed um, feature uh, when making this diagnosis. Whereas in acute myocarditis, uh, it's more predominant complaint were cardiovascular uh, in effect. Also those with acute fulminant myocarditis associated with severe ventricular dysfunction and um, uh, low output state tend to have a, a more abnormal chest x-ray. Uh, but both groups have abnormal ECGs, and both groups, more in the acute fulminant group, have uh, arrhythmias. Now, the, let me go back just to this for one second. The abnormal ECG can be anything from uh, low voltages through to ischemic changes through to arrhythmias. And arrhythmias can be ventricular, they can be uh, isolated or mono, monofocal or uh, multifocal VEBs or bradycardia. The point about arrhythmias is that they are, and we recognize this now, a very important sign of doom. You must pay attention to them 
And in fact, the one study that uh, really reinforces this is a study by Sarah Thiel in Boston that demonstrated that arrhythmia on admission is a prediction for ECMO. So if a patient comes to an institution, ED, a pediatric ICU that perhaps doesn't have ECMO facility and has acute myocarditis with arrhythmias, you should be seriously considering transferring that patient to a place that can do mechanical support. Arrhythmias are not something that you can usually control or can often control with drugs alone or with pacemaker. They indicate bad disease and we need to move forward quickly. The same with biomarkers. So troponins have become much more commonly measured in pediatric patients over the last 20 years. And uh, in acute myocarditis, there is a, a huge increase in the troponin level, not just a, a small amount, two or three times normal, but a very large increase in troponin level indicating myocardial injury. This was demonstrated in this study out of Germany, and uh, Ben showed this very clearly as well, looking at uh, multiples of normal uh, in patients that, that had uh, acute myocarditis. You can see that sometimes it's over 100 times normal range is the level of uh, troponin. Interestingly, and very importantly, it's not an indication, though, of a poor outcome. In fact, it's the reverse. It's more indication of perhaps a fulminant state, and those patients have a good outcome. What about echo? Well, imaging with echo uh, is very important. It's part of the diagnostic criteria, and there may be a range of, of abnormalities from wall motion through to a thick septum, AV valve regurgitation, but very important is the LV end diastolic dimension. And this has been demonstrated once again from sick kids and in other studies that if the, if the z-score, so the diameter of the LV end diastolic dimension is um, normal, within normal range, then early recovery is much more likely. If it's dilated on presentation, then recovery of that ventricle, uh, the odds ratio for that is, is much um, changed. So that uh, it's an important diagnostic uh, and predictive tool at this at presentation. One caution, echoes are not without their complications, and I've seen a, a handful of patients who have had an echo with an operator concentrating on the screen, hand on a probe, doing a sub xiphoid approach, not observing the patient, or nobody's observing the patient with this such low output state, and they get into trouble. It's not a, it's not a straightforward diagnostic test. You must have to close observation and monitoring. And this is data once again from Ben that shows that if you present in this light blue line at the bottom, if you present with a small, uh, in, with a normal end diastolic dimension, that you usually maintain that dimension uh, for those that have the early recovery. The, those that have late recovery or no recovery start off with a more dilated ventricle to start with. Cardiac uh, MRI is often seen as the gold standard. Um, I'm not certain that that's the case. You can certainly get hemodynamic assessment, uh, gadolinium enhancement with myocardial, for myocardial edema, uh, hyperemia and fibrosis. All of those can be factors helping you with the diagnosis. And there's a consensus criteria that if you have two of, those th two of the three of those are positive, then there's a pretty tight correlation with uh, biopsy. <laughs> what about biopsy? Well, in many respects, it's also seen as the gold standard. But, and, and in fact, one study that came out of Korea showed that there was, the biopsy actually had predictive value and then it, the, if there was a lymphocyte dominant myocarditis or the presence of fibrosis, then there was a worse longer term outcome. So there's some value in undertaking these procedures. If you look at the trends over the last five years or between five years, 2006 to 2011 in the US, once again, from the large administrative database, the FIS database, you can see that this top line here is the frequency of uh, biopsies, and this line here is the frequency of MRI. So this, they're, they're crossing over. The International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation recently published their guidelines for um, uh, evaluation of children with heart failure, uh, and their recommendations for a cath and um, biopsy were not indicated if minimal symptoms, but it's reasonable to perform it uh, if there's new onset failure, reasonable in patients with, um, uh, when a diagnosis, a specific diagnosis could influence therapy. Once again, these are uh, class 2A, 2B with level of evidence being C, so that there are, it's reasonable to perform, but no hard guidelines. And you have to always balance the risk benefits for these, and I think we appreciate that, so that the, taking an infant with myocarditis who's not ventilated or even on high uh, inotrope support to the MRI and the environment that entails, 
uh, is not an easy thing to do, uh, particularly if they're tachycardic and you're trying to get some sort of gating as well. So it's, it's, a, it's not a straightforward procedure. This, and same with uh, catheterization, the risk for arrhythmia, arrest, perforation is, is a real phenomenon. Um, and you also get limited biopsy sites. We biopsy five to seven sites where it's demonstrated you probably need uh, at least double that from multi-sites to actually make the diagnosis. So um, I'm sorry this is going to come through in a way that I hadn't anticipated, so let me just do this. So the management is still supportive. Reduce oxygen uh, requirement. Temperature management is key. These children often present with uh, shutdown circulation and, and core hypothermia. They're often fretful and agitated, so sedation is sometimes of value, but you have to be very cautious that we don't overdo that. Managing preload with diuresis and fluid restriction is very important. Uh, and then it's a monitoring of response. Um, question of whether you be uh, invasive or non-invasive access always raises its, its, the, its head and the risk of obtaining access can be quite significant. The same with looking for end organ dysfunction and biomarkers. Frequent access to, to these patients can increase their stress. So getting, uh, making a, a judgment early on as to what sort of access they need for blood draws is also very important. Now respiratory support's interesting because this is the type of patient that presented uh, to us not so long ago, and you can see the green there is the gradual rise in heart rate over a period of time. Uh, maintained their saturations, they were tachyptic, but it was pretty stable on non-invasive support. But you can see this progressive tachycardia. That's a bad sign, and you need to be able to trend that over time, not looking at, not look at it at one point in time. This patient had an event um, around the time of intubation. We got to the point where the child was really struggling and needed to be intubated, and this was uh, a profound drop in heart rate at the time of intubation. That was all due to the administration of a paralytic drug. And I think it's an important point that these patients, at the time they lose spontaneous ventilation is the time they get into trouble. They have an acute fall in preload to the heart, and that's what precedes this particular uh, event. We often worry about the drugs we administer for, at the time of uh, intubation or induction. It's the loss of spontaneous ventilation, and I think being prepared for that's very important. So it's about anticipation, and I think we've learned that lesson over 20 years. Where the risks are, the cascade of events that follow on from that, and the uh, sometimes inability to achieve an early return of the circulation, and to understand that these are potentially preventable events. Now the escalation of management of myocarditis perhaps hasn't changed very much. We certainly will en enhance contractility, reduce afterload if the patients are not hypotensive, manage rhythm, once again, be cautious. You may not be able to control the rhythm at all with uh, routine drug therapy or pacemaker. Uh, and the introduction of mechanical support. While well, there are a number of studies that have looked at mechanical support in myocarditis, this first one by Duncan, um, both Des and I were co-authors on that paper. We looked at 15 patients with, uh, from sick kids and from Boston, and we had an 87% survival uh, of 15 patients. And these patients were put on ECMO either because they had a cardiac arrest or because of their uh, low output state with hypotension. But you can see there's, other than the, this one paper here, the survival for myocarditis is actually very good on ECMO. It's the best group in the ULSO registry and in multiple series of uh, ECMO for patients with heart disease. So early ECMO should be instituted. There are a number of ways to then uh, approach that. Uh, if you've got fulminant myocarditis and lung injury, perhaps CPR, go to ECMO. And that you can see that most patients with mechanical support early will be ECMO based on this uh, large cohort study from the uh, FIS database. The other decision point, though, is the patient who's got a dilated heart uh, myopathy with slow deterioration, increasing support, then they may be a group you transition to VAD first rather than going down the ECMO pathway. So the ECMO is certainly the, res the rescue mode. The question is, when do you transfer from ECMO to VAD? There's limited data available on that, but in my experience, and I think it's supported by a number of other, uh, when you read a number of other studies, is that there is, there's no recovery of ejection within 72 hours, and you're unable to wean the patient from support within seven days. Those should be triggers for you going down a longer-term mechanical support. 
Um, often when you go on to ECMO in these patients, the heart has been stressed to such an extent and is so inflamed that as soon as it's decompressed, it, doesn't, it stops. And there may not be any ejection for a period of time. So that, and it may take 72 hours to recover. And being patient and waiting for that is really critical. Otherwise, you'll pull the trigger for either listing for transplantation or VAD unnecessarily. The other thing about these patients is they, they very quickly develop severe pulmonary edema from left atrial hypertension. They must go to the cath lab early to be decompressed, to promote myocardial recovery, and to reduce lung injury. So, last point on immunomodulation. You can see on this slide here from 2006 to 2007, between 60 and an increasing number up into the low 70% of patients received IVIG for acute myocarditis. No data to support that management. And in fact, the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplantation in their recent uh, consensus statement said there is no support at all for corticosteroids or for intravenous immunoglobulin. There's no value in it, don't do it. So what have we learned in 20 years? We know they're very fragile patients, but they have a very high transplant-free survival. We've learned, I think, a better understanding of, that, um, of their phenotype and how to manage that. It's still primarily a clinical ECG echo diagnosis with a real value in, in troponin. And the trade-offs between the risk benefit for uh, MRI and ECMO, uh, uh, MRI and cardiac catheterization and biopsy uh, must always be uh, considered. LVN diastolic dimension on admission is a good predictor of longer term um, outcome. And supportive therapy remains the mainstay. Um, beware arrhythmias, early mechanical support. Thank you.